Thomas uh, Beatty is from the Stewart Observatory, University of Arizona, and he's going to tell us about the detectability of city lights on exoplanets. Thomas, please. Thanks, Jacob. Can everybody hear me? Sounds great. Sounds great. All right. Good morning. Um, I'm over in Arizona. I have to say, I think I've realized I've gone a little bit native because I hear about these hurricanes on the East Coast, and I'm just jealous that we're not getting that rain out here. Um, so I'd like to tell you about um, some work I've been doing about the detectability of, as the title says, nightside city lights on exoplanets. Um, as some background about where I come from, uh, I work on uh, JWST for the NIRCAM uh, instrument team. Um, I do exoplanet atmospheres, and I'm one of the leads for the uh, exoplanet atmosphere observations that will happen with NIRCAM on JWST. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about how do we get precise observations of exoplanets and their atmospheres. And so uh, thinking about techno signatures, uh, the avenue that I am approaching this from is, whoops, is this gonna change slides for me? So what about the planets themselves? And we've been talking about this uh, a little bit, I think uh, today and yesterday and on the Slack channel. Um, but by this, I mean, you know, what can we do by directly characterizing what's going on in the atmosphere and what's going on on the surfaces of exoplanets? And um, I will begin with my conclusions just to make sure that I don't lose you halfway through. Um, and the conclusions of this talk are that currently uh, Earth's city lights are not detectable with current or near future observatories. However, if you assume a slightly higher urbanization level, say 10 times what we have on Earth, and on Earth about a third of a percent of our land mass is uh, in cities, uh, that would be detectable. And it would be detectable up to several parsecs, depending upon exactly what sort of future observatory you want to use and exactly what urbanization level uh, you want to look for. And additionally, one of the advantages of thinking about this is that in many ways, we're going to be getting uh, the observations necessary to detect city lights uh, for free. Because if something like Louvoir is launched and is operational and detects a what looks like a habitable Earth-like planet, um, a lot of time is going to be spent characterizing the atmosphere of that planet. And those are the exact sorts of observations you would want to do to see city lights. Uh, and so we can piggyback on those efforts uh, if and when they occur. Okay, so um, I said I do exoplanet atmospheres. One, I'll just give a little bit of, of background about the current uh, state of the field. Um, one uh, just important thing to have in the back of your heads is that uh, we're getting very good at it. Um, observations to characterize that exoplanet atmospheres are getting increasingly precise uh, to the point where we've begun to crudely map uh, the surfaces of some of the gas giants that we can see and really start drilling down into what their atmospheres are composed of. Um, there's sort of two ways to do this. Right now, the current best way, and I've put best, I've put a little asterisk there because that's saying that's the best is a very editorial comment on my part. Uh, and ironic given that I mainly do eclipse observations, but here we are, um, is using transmission spectroscopy, uh, which this works very well, um, but it probes low pressures in the atmosphere and really only near the planetary terminator. It doesn't give us a lot of information about the spatial distribution of what's happening. In the future, uh, Ideally, what we'd want to do is uh, start doing uh, direct imaging using coronography. And coronography works by you place an occulting disk over the host star uh, that suppresses the starlight from that host star and allows you to then image something like an Earth-like planet. The advantage of doing that sort of direct imaging is that you're seeing emission from the planetary surface that allows you to probe in the atmosphere down to pressures of a bar or even see the planetary surface directly and you get global information about what's going on uh, in the atmosphere and on the surface of the planet. Um, at the moment, there are two major ideas for the next generation coronography missions, Louvoir and HabEx. Both of these are being discussed by the current uh, decadal. Uh, two architectures uh, for each of them sort of are Louvoir A, which is 16 meters, Louvoir B, eight meters. And then HabEx is the baseline's a four meter, but there's an idea to fly a star shade. Um, they're two sort of competing ideas, but just these are the sort of four architectures I'll be talking about uh, in this talk. Louvoir A, Louvoir B, HabEx, and then HabEx with a star shape. 
Um, all of them are doing this pornographic direct imaging. Um, they are considerably exceeding the state of the, the current state of the art, which are the thin lines up at the top of this chart, which show the contrast ratio achievable relative to the host star. Uh, Rowan Space Telescope, RST, is hopefully going to launch in about 10 years. Uh, the chronograph on that will do significantly better than current ground-based instruments. And HabEx and LUVOIR should be able to do uh, an order of magnitude better than RST. So uh, starting to really drill down to the point, you can see I've circled where we could detect Earth directly through direct imaging. Uh, right, and this is going to provide really exquisite spectra of these nearby Earth analogs from these future missions. Um, point being, as I said, that we're getting really good at characterizing the atmospheres and even the surfaces of these exoplanets, particularly if something like Luar Habex flies uh, in the next, say, in the 2030s, if we're being a little bit optimistic. So one, one uh, up to this is that we're really on the cusp of being able to directly detect technological signatures on uh, exoplanets. If, we're, if we can start thinking about reliably detecting biosignatures, we should also be thinking about how do we detect technological signatures directly using the biosignature observations that are going to happen. Um, one assumption that often is made when people are doing biosignatures, and this is a dark screen purposefully, um, is that the night sides of these exoplanets are dark, right? But we know on Earth, the night side of Earth is not dark. We have city lights that are spread out all over the surface of the Earth. And uh, in principle, this is a signal that's detectable from a great distance, right? The Earth side, the, the spectra you would get from something like a Louvoir or Habex if you were imaging the night side of the Earth is not this you know, purely uh, atmospheric and surface spectrum, you get on top of that, you can see in the center, uh, a little bit of a spectroscopic bump where uh, our night side city lights are emitting. And current sodium city lights have very concentrated spectral emission. Uh, that's why you know, they all appear orange, uh, and in principle, that means that even low intensities are detectable. Um, I'll say that uh, I, you know, a lot of sodium lights are being replaced by LED lights, which have a much broader spectrum uh, they emit over, something closer to a black body. Um, in principle, that's also detectable. The, the issue with that is going to be that uh, because the spectrum is so broad, it's going to be difficult to disentangle that from just an elevated background level. Uh, okay, so how do we look at this? Um, there is currently on the uh, SUMI spacecraft uh, an instrument specifically dedicated to imaging nightside city lights on Earth. Uh, using this data, it allows us to look at, you know, actual top of the atmosphere emitted fluxes from the night side of the Earth from cities. Uh, as an example of how sensitive this instrument is, this, I just love this uh, experiment they did. They showed uh, about 200 watt bulb onto a 25 foot tarp, and we're able to detect it in the orbital data uh, pretty robustly. Okay, so um, one interesting thing is that though there's a lot of longitudinal variation in Earth's uh, artificial emission, the actual disk integrated uh, amount of light that Earth is putting out is actually pretty steady uh, over the course of rotation. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that we have a constant surface flux I'm going to uh, ignore any sort of rotational modulation we might be getting. OK, so what do we see? Um, so looking at the planetary night side, most of what you actually would detect is residual starlight. Um, most of what you're seeing here is residual starlight uh, that's unsuppressed by the chronograph. And there is the planetary night side uh, in there somewhere. Um, Earth-like cities around Alpha Centauri, probably the best case we could hope for, uh, are not easily detectable. It's a very small bump and in increase. Uh, however, if Earth had, say, 10 times the urban area, uh, that would be detectable with about 100 hours of Luar time, Luar A time. And I'll point out that these points here actually have error bars that are just extremely small. Turns out if we point a 16-meter space telescope at uh, a planet around Alpha Sen, we can really nail it to the wall. 
So the ultimate limiting case here as we think about increasing urbanization levels is an ecumenopolis. And by that I mean something that is a citywide planet, which uh, depending upon the era of science fiction you grew up with, you can think of either as Coruscant or Trantor. And for an ecumenopolis, those are extremely detectable even out to pretty large distances. So an ecumenopolis in orbit around Delta Pavanus, which is about six parsecs away, would be strongly detected at about 12 sigma by Louvoir A. And Louvoir A could even make significant, and by that I mean greater than three sigma detections of ecumenopoli, out to about 18 parsecs. Um, so here's a little contour plot of sort of distance and uh, urbanization fraction and how well you'd be able to detect them. Uh, I've put some sort of uh, a couple of greatest hit stars here to show you where they might show up. Uh, Tau Ceti is a little over 10%. Delta Pavanus we could do at 25%. The furthest distance we'd really need city planets. I'll also note at the top there, there's a hatch region that says inside IWA. That's the inner working angle of the coronagraph. Beyond that distance, Earth analogs, habitable Earth-like planets, uh, are too close to their stars for the coronagraph to image. So you can play this game, make these same contour plots for different stellar types, different primary stars, and different architectures. And you can see, as you move left to right here, as you go from sun-like stars to smaller stars down to M dwarfs, it gets easier to detect planets at a given urbanization level. But you're restricted in the volume of space you can survey. Because as you get to say an M, M0 dwarf, a habitable planet is, gets close enough that it, you begin to move inside the inner working angle of the coronagraph, uh, even at about four or five parsecs. Well, for a sun-like star, you can do this up to about 18. Um, of course, the best is uh, Louvoir A. Uh, you know, putting 16 meters in space really helps a lot. Um, Habex does pretty well. Baseline Habex without the starshade uh, can uh, detect some targets. The starshade helps a lot. That lowers the achievable contrast by about a factor of 10. Um, but of course, that's sort of a generic uh, set of targets, right? Uh, we actually know uh, most of the nearby stars, pretty much all the nearby stars, would actually want to do this survey on. So what does that look like? What is the minimum detectable urbanization fraction for a set of nearby stars. And I've sort of chosen here, uh, this is a little bit of a, a, a very subjective list of stars that uh, sort of are sort of the, um, the usual suspects, say, from science fiction or from habitability studies uh, and some other nearby uh, candidates. And you can see that a lot of what works are you either have to be nearby or you have to be an M dwarf. Um, and sort of the best you can do around, say, Alpha Sen B or, say, LaSalle 9352 is probably about 10 times Earth's urbanization fraction. For something like Tau Ceti, Epsilon Indi, uh, Delta Pavanus, you probably need to be significantly higher at 10 or even 20 percent before you start getting significant detections of nightside city lights. Okay. So I'll leave it my conclusions. Um, I won't read these, but I will just reiterate uh, the idea um, that uh, we're getting very good at measuring exoplanet atmospheres. Um, precise enough that we can really begin thinking about directly detecting technosignatures uh, in the atmospheres and on the surfaces of these planets, as we've all been talking about, right? Um, and one of the ways we can do this is nightside city lights. Earth is not detectable, but planets with uh, a little bit more urbanization level would be detectable using next generation uh, observatories, um, which uh, I think is very exciting because it really expands us from looking for, you know, people beaming radio messages at us to we can actually just go find them if they're out there and we don't have to wait for them uh, to come to us. So thank you and I will take questions with my remaining time.